Welcome everybody to the Tripolitan. My name is Rafat Yamak. Today our guest is Yasser al-Masri, who I'm not going to lie, we go pretty way back. Uh, a little bit about Yasser. Uh, Yasser is a practicing architect, Fulbright scholar, and Rhodes Scholar finalist with an award-winning academic record. Currently he is pursuing a PhD in architecture with a focus on high-performance buildings at Georgia Tech and serving as a GRA on a U.S. Department of Energy funded project. Yasser holds an MS in Sustainable Design and Certification in Energy Studies from the University of Texas at Austin and a BS in Architecture from the Beirut Arab University. Yasser, thank you so much for being on today. Thank you so much, Rafat. I'm very excited to be um, here, part of the Tripal. Likewise, man. Likewise, I'm excited to have you on. It's, uh, it's always great to have you, and we've discussed um, the topic that we're going to be discussing today which is Tripoli and uh, the challenges Tripoli is facing and really misconceptions surrounding the city. Um, so I'm really excited to kind of, you know, um, to bring this conversation that we've had several times over the phone and personally uh, to this podcast and to discuss it, you know, between two people from the same city um, who kind of have, uh, I would say, especially you, you have a unique perspective having lived and grown up in Tripoli. Um, would you mind just giving us a brief background about your, you know, upbringing in Tripoli, um, you know, where you went for middle school, high school, uh, where your parents originally from in Tripoli or greater Tripoli? Of course, of course. So, um, funnily enough, uh, none of my parents are actually from Tripoli. Um, my father is from Akkad and my mom is from Beirut. Um, but they actually had met in Tripoli. So, um, uh, not to go too deep into the family history, but my mother's family had moved to Tripoli uh, at a time. And that is a that is a matter of uh, that point is, is pretty significant because this was, um, you know, this was a viable economic move, which is for someone to move from Beirut to Tripoli at a particular time, uh, which is something we don't really see uh, anymore. And I think this should definitely be part of the conversation we're having. Um, and. And my mother and father had met there. They both went to the Tripoli Evangelical School. Uh, the, you know, they met there. Uh, and uh, I actually was born in Dubai. I lived oh. there for five years. Uh, okay. But then, but then, you know, we moved back uh, to to Lebanon and to Tripoli. And um, from there, I just you know lived lived in the city all my life. And and really, it became a, you know a, a big part of me. A bit and and. You know, I love it personally. Uh, I've I've grown with it. I've seen uh, how much potential it has, and and through the time, um, you know, when you see something with so much potential, and at the same time, you when you're met with this much injustice, uh, you become part of a uh, of a vocal voice, so that you wanna you wanna like you know spread the good message. One hundred percent, Ben. One hundred percent. Honestly, uh, uh, like I said, you know, it's uh, you know, although we're, we're we're bringing up this topic on this podcast, we've discussed this many times before, and Tripoli has come. You know, it's it's been at the forefront of uh, many news stories, and uh, we're going to be getting into a lot of this, you know, throughout the episode about uh, the misconceptions surrounding Tripoli, uh, and you know, kind of the news stories and the way they frame the narrative around Tripoli. Exactly. However, um, I wanted to just kind of get a contextualized history of Tripoli. You know, when it comes to Tripoli or Tarablus, you know, in Arabic, there is always this question about, uh, you know, the identity of the city. Is Tripoli yeah. Lebanese? Is Tripoli Shami? Is Tripoli part of Lebanon? How Lebanese is Tripoli? All these kind of questions that kind of come up um, from various outlets, um, um, various voices that kind of question the identity of the city um, due to many reasons, obviously. Uh, but I was just kind of curious to see as somebody who's grown up in the city and who's very familiar with, you know, who follows uh, domestic domestic news in Lebanon, why do these questions really arise? Where do they stem from? And what is the purpose of these questions really that are that are sometimes asked by different, um, you know, segments of Lebanese society? That's definitely a, a large question to kind of tackle. Uh, but, but, you know, when we look at it um, at, a, at a finer uh, level, we can start unfolding or unpacking really the, the depth of this question. I definitely say um, the very identity of, of Tripoli is something that's always up, up in debate. Um, whether it is, you know, Lebanese or not, essentially, uh, is something that is brought up by both, you know, it's uh, people supporting it and at the same time, you know, people that want to detract from it. 
Um, Tripoli definitely is uh, unique within, you know, the Lebanese landscape in a way, um, because the at least the value that it had preceded the very idea of of Greater Lebanon. Now, other cities, and I and and I dare say even Beirut, by the way, uh, was was never as big as Tripoli or had the same value. Um, until very late in the in the in the eighteen hundreds, mm-hmm. um, so you know for 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 almost a thousand years, you know Tripoli was definitely always on the forefront. Uh, and the point is um, that you know I'm trying to drive here is that it always had a lot of value, and within the Greater Lebanon, because it was given kind of second fiddle, uh, mm-hmm. for different reasons, it definitely uh, would you wouldn't see you know the people accept the idea or like that second fiddle when you know it had served as kind of kind of a main beacon um throughout you know centuries before it and i guess it's it's from that very small detail uh why this complicated relationship between you know tripoli and lebanon per se mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um and you know taking it historically even when the french mandate started and had you know uh kind of announced that you know this is uh the greater lebanon or like the creation of the state of lebanon uh and this is in 1920 um, the the, the Tri- Travoltans were among the first that actually went out and pro- to protest against it. Um, they they did not want it to be that way. They were they were at the time still seeing their, themselves as part of you know a greater um, Arab a pan Arab kind of state or uh, maybe even you know within part of Greater Syria mm-hmm. because of the ties that it had there. So from from the from the onset, you know, the relationship wasn't exactly uh, going well, uh, and and really. Because to the, at least the Tripolitans, kind of this um, this division of the uh, you know of, of the region along colonial lines was something that didn't go well with them. Because uh, let's just say that before I you know go too too long in my answer, because it's definitely a big one. Um, T- Tripoli was always a port for the internal cities of Syria and even Iraq. So the the famous Mosul, Homs, and Tripoli line trade line. Uh, it, it was really the life, the lifeblood of the city, um, and effectively by cutting it off into three different countries, uh, you really, from an economic perspective um, and the social perspective, because again, traders, you know, build social relationships. They even intermarry uh, people from these different, you know, places. And to them, uh, cutting it up is definitely something that doesn't work, uh, you know, for in favor of the city. You know, you know, it's a, it's an interesting thing you you raised about Tripoli's you know strategic location. Mm-hmm. And how it offers that those inroads uh, into you know Levantine cities, Shami mm-hmm. cities like you know Aleppo, Homs, and even Iraq, you know cities like Mosul, for example, yep. or Mosul. Um, mm-hmm. It's funny. My, my my father was telling me uh, you know a story. He was telling me um, you know like a long time ago, like in you know early seventies and even sixties, that there used to be these traders who used to come from, if I'm not mistaken, Aleppo. They used to come to Tripoli. Yep, and yep. conduct some trade. And this was even after like the whole, you know, mandate and the borders were cemented. But even then in the 60s, Tripoli had this, you know, prominent role. And they would come and they would stay at my grandfather's house. They would like stay there, like basically Airbnb for like two, three days, conduct their <laughs> business and then, you yeah. know, go back to Aleppo. It was a yearly thing that they would do. Yeah. And my father, he recalls, you know, this family and, uh, you know, the trade ties that existed between uh, the city of Tripoli and um, you know the rest of uh, the rest of the region, you mentioned uh, Greater Lebanon, by the way. And if if you don't mind, can you kind of just describe a bit within the Tripolitan context what is Greater Lebanon exactly? Uh, you know, for somebody who probably like from our audience who looks who thinks Greater Lebanon, you think you know how much greater it's not it's not that big. What do you mean by Greater Lebanon? You know, a yeah. country the size of Connecticut. <laughs> so would you mind just explaining a little bit about this uh, this uh, concept? Greater Lebanon. Of course, of course. So really, to start with what Greater Lebanon was, we need to start with now what is known as Smaller Lebanon. Uh, Smaller Lebanon effectively is the region which is today roughly uh, Mount Lebanon. Uh, Mount Lebanon is one of the you know uh, biggest provinces in in Lebanon and definitely a mainstay uh, of, of what it is. Uh, it's it's both it both serves as the cultural inspiration of, of you know what what at least Lebanese culture is effectively, and you know this is a deep rooted area with with a lot of history in it. Um, that that area of like smaller Lebanon uh, was actually around a third of what the country is now. So it was around three thousand three hundred you know squared kilometers. Well, Lebanon today is is the known ten thousand four hundred fifty two, um, and. Uh, 
there it was mainly inhabited uh, with with uh, inhabited by Maronite Christians and uh, and Druze. Uh, and and in that particular area, it, it it is of interest at least in the history of the region because it was actually um, the first autonomous region within the the Ottoman Empire. Mm -hmm. um, there was there was autonomy within it that you know allowed it uh, as as kind of a province more. Uh, leverage to do what it want. There were different systems that went into it. Famous ones like the Qa'am Maqamiya and the Mutasadifiya, like post the 1860s. Um, so it really was kind of the core of creating the idea of like, you know, Lebanon as a, a separate nation and not, you know, just something beyond that. Uh, but really, you know, uh, to counter that, there were cities that were well established way before you know this this particular status quo which are which include and actually are are you know like the main of them would be would be tripoli uh because tripoli was you know out of the smaller lebanon sphere or mount lebanon and but it was thriving and it was doing well and it was doing well um uh you know through through different parts of the history so you know the um, the Umayyad uh, uh, Khalif, which is uh, Muawiyah, actually ordered you know building the fleets uh, that were that were supposed to go and, and on the conquest of Constantinople uh, through the port of Tripoli. So that you know would show you how old the relationship would be uh, there, and and definitely this goes even you know before there were even the Romans uh, uh, had had definitely a role for it to play but i'm speaking kind of more on the contemporary you know like arab yeah, islamic yeah. kind of uh, kind of era so it goes back definitely to the to the uh almost 1400 years with caliph muawiyah and you know as uh as you know things changed even during during the abbasids it, it played a big role and i'd say actually during the fatimid rule um the fatimids actually gave tripoli a very specific uh interest um, and, you know, at the time, Tripoli was actually one of the richest uh, cities on earth, uh, to be honest, uh, at the time of the Fatimids. They gave it a lot of, uh, um, you know, economic care. Um, and, you know, with the, with, the, with the coming of the Crusades as well, the Crusades built the biggest citadel uh, right. in Lebanon, in modern day Lebanon there, which is the Remont de saint Gilles citadel inside of Tripoli. Uh, it right. is still the biggest within all of Lebanon. Mm -hmm. um, and as well... Uh, you know, the Mamluks, when they came in, they destroyed much of the um, Crusader city that was before it, uh, but they rebuilt it. Um, so Mansur Qalamun, uh, actually the, the uh, 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 you know, the Mamluk leader uh, went into the city after the siege um, and rebuilt it. And now we have, you know, uh, like the Jam al-Mansuri, the Mansuri Mosque. Uh, and the city is definitely one of the, the most important um uh, monuments in it and as well you know it is the second biggest mamluk city after cairo and you know cairo being the very center of mamluk rule shows you that you know uh, with with tripoli being the second one that shows you the, the level of importance it had there um and yeah and during even the ottoman times uh you know it really had its own so it was actually the center um of a province and even that called you know uh the ottomans would call them iyale or wilaya yeah. Uh, and, you know, Tripoli was actually a wilaya on its own. It was the center of a much bigger um, province that, uh, you know, went into Syria. So this kind of included uh, areas on the Syrian coast as well, you know, uh, and other areas of Syria. So that kind of shows you that it was belonging to a different cultural and economic sphere yeah. than that of, of, of Mount Lebanon uh, yeah. or, you know, uh, and, and what was, you know, smaller Lebanon at the time. Yeah. Um, so effectively, to kind of just wrap it up, when... When, when, the, when the ideas of smaller Lebanon wanted to become greater Lebanon, and this was an idea being pushed specifically by the uh, Maronite patriarch, Elias uh, Hwayik, which went to, the, um, uh, to, to France after post-World War I and, and you know, was presenting this idea to the French that they wanted to create a, a, a country. Um, that which is you know Lebanon. Uh, it kind of they added the provinces around Mount Lebanon, which included you know uh, North Lebanon and Tripoli, uh, and, and kind of Tripoli was absorbed into this new uh, into this new uh, state, but it was not at its center. Um, the center was you know chosen as Beirut and you know Mount Lebanon in a way, and you know it was kind of uh, put as a secondary or tertiary part of it. So it kind of just lost the centrality of its role from you know a major city on the coastline and and you know uh, going beyond these these known borders, and it was just kind of you know uh, ham fisted into it and just said you know look yeah we 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 are part of it. I mean uh, yes, sir. I, it was, this was a beautiful synopsis of basically. 
uh, you know, Tripoli's, uh, you know, contextual history within all these different empires that ruled and uh, your connection to greater Lebanon and how it basically, um, you know, the, how this entity formed and the friction that resulted uh, due to this uh, formation of something called Lebanon, basically. So uh, I want to thank you for this great synopsis. You, you know, you, 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 go, you go through all these, um, you know, the prominence of Tripoli, um, you know, over the course of history and then how it kind of starts to lose significance with the establishment of Lebanon, right? Uh, although it is a major port, uh, Beirut slowly started to eclipse Tripoli in importance. Um, but, uh, you know, th then that really comes and it brings to my next point, which is, yes, Tripoli used to be, you know, uh, crucial and important uh, in terms of its, uh, and it's, it still is in terms of its strategic location. However, as an economic powerhouse, not so much, you know, and the stats show that from the HDI, you know, index to the unemployment rate, the poverty levels in Tripoli is extremely high. And uh, you wonder, why is Tripoli so economically marginali marginalized? And, you know, how, if it wasn't marginalized, how much it could bring prosperity and, you know, economic wellness to the entire country. Do, do you have any, you know, thoughts about why Tripoli has started to kind of, it continues to be marginalized by the central government, and a lot of people from Tripoli, as you know, they claim that it's done on purpose. You know, it's not something just kind of done, uh, yeah. you yeah. know, because uh, it just so happens to be so that it's purposely done against the city of Tripoli. So I just want to hear your thoughts about that as well. Um, yeah, definitely this is kind of, you know, going at the core and the heart of the problem. Um, I'd say, and again, you know, this is my own analysis of it, and, and definitely, you know, everyone might have their own. Yeah. But I'd say this actually goes two ways. Um, the first, the first is that yes, there is a, you know, sustained systematic, um, uh, uh, you know, marginalization happening from the central government, and that that actually uh, has its own reasons. So in general, um, you know, Lebanon is a is a country that's almost always built on these kind of uh, uh, solutions that no one is completely happy about, but it's like, you know, they're just, you're just finding a common middle ground for it. Um, and it really is, uh, in a way, sadly, very tribal in its nature, although, you know, uh, it, 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 this is a, it doesn't have a tribal history, uh, effectively, like, you know, let's say the tribes of the Arabian Peninsula, yeah. but it is very tribal as, you know, uh, the sects that are, that make it up, uh, actually are very tribal in the way they operate and think. Yeah, it's more like, it's more like clans, I feel like, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Clans or, you know, or, or tribes even in a way, but the way, you know, if we're, if we're taking the idea of, of Asabiya, of like, you know, Ibn Khaldun talking yeah. about this ideas of like states, it's like many operating states within, you know, a bigger kind of geographic um, uh, entity. And this, and, and geographically, this is super important because of the way things are distributed. So you, when you look at, you know, at, at Lebanon, you, I mean, this, this is a country that's like, um, that just turned a hundred years old last, uh, last November. Uh, and still, you know, it does not have that, um, you know, it has a, almost a bloody history because it spent a lot of it in conflict in a way. Um, and it, it wasn't really doing well. So these clans kind of are still operating in the mindset that things have to be kind of divided up equitably. Um, and the idea is that, you know, when you look at the city of Beirut, for example, Mm -hmm. All the main clans kind of have a little enclave within it, um, and you know this gives them this this gives access economically. And just to be honest, this is mostly an economic issue. Yeah. Um, they get access to to it all, so you're able to divide the spoils of the city um, a, 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 among these clans. So you know, and at least when you look at you know the city of Beirut, uh, you have a, a very prominent you know historical Sunni presence. Uh, you have a actually. Um, Orthodox Christian prominent, uh, you know, uh, historical presence there. Um, yep. And then, you know, on a more recent and contemporary move, a Maronite Christians had moved from Mount Lebanon to, to Beirut. Um, and as well, the Shia Muslims had moved from the south towards Beirut. Um, and now you, you kind of had this big mosaic of these different people. But the, the key was that, you know, every single project that can, can happen in Beirut and specifically governmental uh, issues, they can be easily divided up among them. So you can have, you know, an employee from that sect and that clan and that clan and that clan. Um, so, you know, it was it, it's kind of like an economic monopoly among them. The issue with, with Tripoli, though, is that it had um, 
you know, it has a uh, uh, it has a historical Sunni presence as being you know a city on the on the coast, mm -hmm. and, 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 and it as well has a uh, again an Orthodox Christian presence um, mm -hmm. that is that is prominent as well, and there is you know a, a certain Maronite presence there, but it lacks you know the other um, demographic the major demographic players in the country, mm -hmm. uh, and had it you know had this bigger diversity, this is just a an issue of you know geography, and this is my own analysis of it. Mm -hmm. had it had that it would have been easier to you know push for for bigger economic growth because then you could divide it up equitably mm -hmm. um to, 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 the, to the way the lebanese mind thinks that you know when you give a particular area um, economic prominence you are giving the majority uh, citizens living there and and whatever the clan uh, they they belong to an advantage over the others and that yeah. cannot that cannot you know um, occur and you know when you look at at least the demographic changes that occurred in Beirut over the civil war and even post it but mainly in the civil war this was really a fight over you know the economics so you know mainly let's say um, uh, when when let's Imam Musa Sadr was saying that uh, created the Mahrumin um, uh, movement and Mahrumin here means you know people that are uh, maybe poor in a way or the, you know they're not getting enough um, th this really coincided with a movement towards the capital and the creation of an enclave around the capital geographically you know proximal in a way to be able to get a piece of the cake which i you know at the time uh, uh had had put the shia muslims outside this you know division right. so they they felt at a time we're not getting our own fair you know peace and and that really translated into you know a, a mass uh movement towards a certain part of the city and creating an enclave there and you know growing it into a prominent one now same mm -hmm. thing this is this is this is to me the core of the problem with why uh, you know the the government doesn't want to look at Tripoli, and this is to, it's very specifically to not give economic advantages to citizens belonging to certain clans in different in different cities. That's from the systematic perspective. Yeah. Um, but I believe there is as well a you know an internally uh, yes. an internal problem within the city that you know we can't just completely blame it on the on the on the system. As although the system definitely does a lot, I would say that you know. Um, uh, Tripoli being a place of heritage and, and tradition, and you know, was very proud of this heritage and tradition. I'd say uh, th it, this tradition came with a with a small price of uh, initially, and which, which is going into a bigger price always, of you know, sticking even economically into tradition. So you know, the way at least economics is done in Tripoli is that you know there are famous families known for you know having businesses so let's say the halab yeah. family you know they're they're in sweets uh, let's say the ba'ar family they're in like you know um they're butchers and at the same time they uh uh, uh they they have restaurants uh you have you know maybe the halabi family they work with textiles etc mm -hmm. this is a you know a very old kind of 1800s economic system which is you know i have a a shop i i grow it i have a couple of sons or you know daughters but mainly sons at least in you know traditionally speaking where you know the son takes off the uh the family business or it's divided yeah. among them this doesn't really open this this kind of you know economic system of entrepreneurship is, is kind of obsolete you know you're not this doesn't grow this doesn't give you the potential to to, to create economic growth so mm -hmm. you know in a way you would never hear in in, in tripoli in general of, of a place that is actually built on, you know, like maybe stocks or dividends or even like a different shareholders. This is always a very kind of, you know, controlled, um, guarded business that, you know, this has to exist within the family. Uh, and, you know, that, that this has to be inherited This you know, you're not yeah. opening it up. And this really uh, doesn't open up the the potential for big business uh because you know everyone's like i don't want anyone to work with me so i'll i'll grow it slowly but that slowness of growth uh definitely doesn't open it up to to you know a different kind of um uh, way of doing business which is yep well i need a lot of money now to grow exponentially uh you know the in, in the modern business world what you would do is you would say you know well i am um, selling some stocks, maybe, you know, I want to, if you want to come into this particular company or, you know, like this, uh, this idea, uh, you, you can be an investor. This is something, you know, I think uh, is definitely always stopping this, this extra cautiousness of like conducting business and not wanting to involve anyone else. I um, think, I think, you know, it's, it's even uh, just uh, really, cause this, this point is so crucial. I, I, I feel like it's more of a, uh, even of a shammy problem, like this kind of classist Yes. Uh, you know, makeup of you know, because even like for example, if if you look at you know Damascus pre twenty eleven, 
there is that level of classism that kind of exists and permeates in society. And Tripoli, you feel like it's it's no different kind of. You know, you kind of have these, uh, you know, old school, like cemented families that have, you know, um, that have, you know, really governed a lot of the facets of economic life in Tripoli. And really, this is the, kind of the first time I've actually heard it from this perspective that this might actually hinder economic growth in the city and allowing new new parties to enter in and you know create new innovative ideas yeah and and to be very clear you 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 when you now allude to the idea of like you know society and these families uh i will go ahead i have many friends from these you know prominent families which which i you know i respect and, and love but i have to say that the way at least the the patriarchs of these families have operated um uh have, have has really hindered a lot of growth not just economic even social so even like they intermarried from specific um you know only these specific like families uh it's kind of a classist kind of idea yeah um you know that exists there that you know people that are um you know internally uh they believe that you know we have we, we have roots in the city that go way back it's very as you said yeah this is a chamois problem in general and it yeah. really is a very you know old school thinking because as well maybe someone coming out from you know like outside the city yeah uh, maybe if you want to kind of integrate within it that you you don't get the same kind of um uh you know the same kind of opportunities as someone from the outside and as well you mean uh competition is not something that's you know very fondly looked at because as i said each each family probably has its own um uh kind of uh particular line of business and it almost has it exclusively um, and, you know, anyone trying to go into it, usually that doesn't lead up, you know, to, um, to, to good outcomes in a way. So it really isn't a very um, easy to operate business and economic kind of environment uh, and social as well, to be honest, because, you know, outsiders are still treated as outsiders within, you know, those other cities. And I'm not saying that doesn't exist. I mean, this is very, you know, common in Beirut as well, which right. is as much as it's a cosmopolitan city. Yep. Yep. There are, you know, some some families in Beirut that kind of, you know, consider and, you know, I'd say it's the same even in New York. You know? yep. uh, go yep, to New yep. York, you can you can find, you know, like the New York elite in a way. Um, but the, the other thing is when well, while this can exist on a social level, the problem, uh, what, what we have is that it extends to the economic level. Uh, when, you know, this is starting to hinder your economic partnerships and ability to grow, uh that that's not gonna let you you know in a way um kind of uh, beat that uh, so i'll just give a very small example yep. um back in the day uh when when prime minister rafi hariri was was you know a prime minister in lebanon uh he had an idea which is to to, to turn the uh uh the uh, the rashid karami international expo which is you know one of the biggest in the in the area yep. uh actually he had he was making a deal with the chinese to create a permanent Chinese exhibition inside of it. Th what that would mean is that, you know, um, rather than like traders at the time or, you know, people that want to go get Chinese um, Chinese merchandise, mm -hmm. rather than them going to travel to China to go see it, these Chinese companies would have like kiosks in certain uh, places where they display their products. And all you had to do from around Lebanon and around the, the Middle East and even from Europe, because it's all way, way, way easier to get to Tripoli than to get somewhere else, yep. is that you would come to the expo and you would see what they have on, on show and you would just order it from there. Mm -hmm. um, what that would have done, you know, that would have been a, a economic revolution you know, beyond anything, because uh, what you would need with that is that, A, you're getting a lot of um, expatriates, you would need, you know, a, a huge hotel sector, you would need a huge entertainment sector, um, you know, you would, you would, uh, you would need uh, a, a lot of, you know, even international, anything that has to do with, you know, like international business, uh, translation, etc. it comes along. And at the time, uh, the, the, the people of Tripoli and the traders of Tripoli, those old school traders actually um, you know, were vehemently against the project and they started saying, you know, well, this is going to, um, uh, you know, this is going to run us out of business. We're, you know, we're a small business. This is local. Yeah. And really the project was put on hold and then, you know, it, it was canceled. And, yeah. and, and this is a, um, you know, this is one of the, I consider tragedies uh, that, that, that occurred because this old school, you know, small business type of thinking actually was starting to stop the, the you know, the, uh, the international business kind of the bigger, the, you know, the bigger aspects of how it occurs um, from happening. And to that note, I just want to add that small businesses only cater to locals. 
Um, you rarely, ex you know, with the exception of, let's say, the, the Halab Suites, which yeah. kind of became an international business. Um, and let's say that even the even the restaurant sector in Tripoli does cater to people from outside the city in a way. Yep. But other, other than that, there really isn't, uh, you know, that huge, you know, creation of, of something that's like a brand or something that's, you know, um, going out. And and the halab is really the exception, not really the the rule in yeah, a way. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, others have, have failed. So it's really just money within the city. It's it's locals buying from that, you know, and it's a cycle. This isn't we're introducing a new pool of money from outside that, you know, could grow the, the general regional GDP of the of the of the city. I'm I'm sorry I'm going to the economics that way, but it's a really important no, it's subject great. to kind of touch it, on. It's yep. it's actually it's 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 really great, man, because this is the kind of perspective that you won't really hear sometimes. Uh, it's you know you'll you'll hear it maybe discussed in you know in living rooms in Tripoli, but uh, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm I really appreciate the fact that you've you know kind of brought this to to the spotlight because it's really important and you're delving into really deep rooted, uh, you know issues that are connected yeah. to this topic, um, and especially you know the classist component that you that you mentioned. So mm -hmm. obviously you know with Tripoli men we, we discussed the um. Uh, you know, the economic marginalization, whether it's from the central government and the internal dynamics that hinder economic growth as well. Uh, there is obviously another further component that um, has been a huge, I feel, like stain on Tripoli, which is the media portrayal of Tripoli. Yeah. Uh, you know, many times, especially, you know, after the revolution that happened in, you know, what was it, 2020, right? Or 2019, late 2019? 2019 to 2020, it, it was, uh, you know, yeah, so, you know, there was at the time, you know, uh, Sahd al -Nur, Nur, mm -hmm. the Noor roundabout, basically, it became, uh, you know, a hotbed for revolutionary fervor, and, you know, everybody was saying, oh, look, you know, Tripoli is, uh, you know, it's uh, it's part of the Lebanese fabric, and look at them, you know, quote, you know, protesting, blah, 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 all that stuff. And, of course, there was one thing that really, you know, used to bother me, you know, you'd have some people say, oh, see, I, we told you guys, Tripoli isn't Kandahar, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And when they say Kandahar, they, they were referring to, you know, this, you know, a period of time that the city was run by, you know, kind of more draconian policies. But it, it's, mm -hmm. it's bother, it bothers me as somebody who's from Tripoli mm -hmm. that somebody would have to say that, you know what I mean? And the media portrayal of Tripoli, they always, you know, the Lebanese media portrayal, they give it this image of, you know, backward or having suffering from some kind of, you know, rampant extremism. Um, and obviously this has affected business, this has affected tourism. And as you mentioned, you know, before in the in, the, in this podcast episode, you've mentioned that Tripoli is the second city after Cairo with the most Mamluk architecture. Mm -hmm. The city has a unique Shami, uh, you know, style, architectural yep. style. And especially, you know, after the Syrian uprising with many of the Syrian cities destroyed, Tripoli remains probably one of the few Shami cities that is basically still intact. You yeah. know what I mean? Historically. Exactly. Um, so I just wanted you to also, you know, just kind of discuss that uh, media portrayal. And if you agree with my assessment, you know, that's just what I think about it and how it's affected Tripoli. I totally agree with this kind of assessment. The media has definitely been been very uh, harsh on the city, and not without you know reason. Uh, the thing is, is that uh, with with all honesty, the media in Lebanon is generally uh, controlled by uh, uh, at least, or it is centralized within the Mount Lebanon region, uh, effectively uh, with certain local TVs uh, existing more towards the so southern Lebanon in a way. Uh, and in Beirut, that's really where it is. So first of all, there is no local TV channel in any way um, to, to kind of present the counter narrative. So you really are under the mercy of if right now those um, those TV channels, as I said, from different provinces uh, kind of like you or are you serving their agenda or not or not. So we can really see that. So when like, you know, the uh, the, the 2019 October Revolution occurred, because this was in line with a lot of the um, agendas of, of people uh, working in those TV stations. Um, they, they gave a very good uh, coverage of Tripoli and, you know, they were um, very positive about it. But at a time, for example, when the, you know, when the Syrian uprising was occurring and, and Tripolitans were uh, actually, you know, uh, standing with the Syrian people uh, against the brutality of the Assad regime, um, this, doesn't, this doesn't serve uh, the, the agendas of the TV stations, which, as I said, are situated in different provinces. Yeah. And 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 in a way, 
uh, the the people running those uh, those TV stations and who they represent are people supporting the idea of you know minority rule and the and and uh, in the region and you know what the Assad regime stands for um, while at the same time you know Yanni uh, in a way kind of um, ignoring the idea that you know there is uh, there is brutality occurring against a human being and politics really falls at that particular point yeah. um, but um, and that's kind of like the sad part about it so. This, we have to always remember that Tripoli was was the city that gave the Syrian regime the biggest headache when it was overtaking Lebanon uh, during the 70s and 80s. Um, you know, the, the, the defense of the city um, created almost local legends uh, that we know of, like, you know, uh, uh, Abu Arabi, uh, uh, famous, and, and Bilal Matar, and, and all the other, um, you know, kind of Tripoli youth at the time that uh, were resisting the Syrian occupation and, and even the people from the Tawhid movement. Uh, and, and we're just talking history here. This isn't, you know, in support of any anyone or, or, yeah. or, or any, any of the ideas. Uh, but they really um, gave a, a lot of issues because they were really standing with, with the PLO and, you know, the Palestinian cause at the time. Uh, you know, when when uh, the Assad Syrian uh, regime uh, was, was fighting the PLO, um, and and they were fighting uh, Yasser Arafat's forces uh, across northern Lebanon and specifically in the city of Tripoli. So the point is, uh, from day one, it really was you know against this this this, this whole kind of takeover in a way. Uh, and and this was the same even with you know as I said before the French takeover of Lebanon. Tripoli has always always been um, not accepting of any. Uh, any regional kind of interference in any way or any regional um, agenda other than that of the Palestinian cause. Uh, it gave a lot of leeway to the Palestinian cause um, and, and at least the Arabist causes, but it did not, you know, go easy with the with the French. Um, it, it resisted them. Uh, it, it resisted them both, you know, uh, for, through protest, through signing a petition saying that they do not want to join, you know, the, the colonial state. Uh, they as well, you know, um, uh, even, you know, they suffered casualties uh, from, from French military yeah. uh, during protests that, you know, were happening around the time of, of independence. Yeah. Same thing with the Syrians, you know, it always stood steadfast. They fought uh, and there were a lot of massacres, the famous Tabani massacre uh, that occurred um, and the destruction of the um, IPT uh, oil refinery by Syrian forces, yes. uh, which just kind of destroyed an economic lifeline for the city as well. This, this one is in the uh, Badawi, correct? The IPT? Yes, in the Badawi, but yeah. that, the Badawi region is generally considered, you know, a northern suburb right. of Tripoli. And, and uh, so, you know, people from Tripoli would be working there. Yeah. Um, so it, it definitely is, you know, all part of it. So the issue is, is if Tripoli had just goes always um, easily, you know, shut, shuts its mouth in a way and, 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 and just gets along with it, uh, I would assure you it would be in a much better place. Uh, but generally resisting, uh, resisting any form of foreign intervention uh in a way is is really what it's known for and this is what causes a lot of the issues um and and i think that is what 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 the price is to be paid paid for and the media because it represents people that are pro uh, some type of um foreign intervention yeah. they will always you know depending if at this point they are with or against they will be giving you the uh the accurate representation so i would just give one more example yeah. when you know uh, when the united states was actually invading you know iraq there were a lot of uh uh protests that occurred in tripoli as well and even targeting certain you know american fast food chains mm -hmm. that occurred in a way um, and you know, with people supporting uh, at least the U.S. invasion, you know this this is this was a this was a great opportunity to kind of put the city within the within the frame of uh, you know well you know this is a city supporting let's say uh, terrorists or let's say that or this. But at its core, Tripoli always has stood for one thing: no, not allowing foreign intervention into both Lebanon as a state you know, as we give an example, and the, the, the Arab and Islamic region as a whole. Um, and this is why, you know, I'll, we don't have representation through the media to kind of give a counter uh, uh, narrative. So what you're listening to is really effectively what, uh, whatever, you know, the the media wants to tell you today, whether it, they go with it or against it. And you know, yes, sir, I have to give a shout out right now, since this is a great <laughs> yep. transition into, you know, while we're speaking about organic outlets in Tripoli and then and the necessity to have to be honest organic media outlets and it's it's kind of still shocking that there hasn't been a more organized effort yep. uh, from the city to generate something like this 
I have to drop uh, Tripolis's name <laughs> yeah. into this yep. podcast. Uh, yeah. I know you are the founder of uh, Tripolicy. Well, you're the co-founder, so yeah. we, both are, <laughs> we both have a stake in that one. Yeah, yeah. you know, w- would you mind sharing a bit about, uh, you know, just, I, I know we've worked on this project together, but yeah. uh, I would love to just kind of uh, discuss what inspired you to come up with the idea. And, you know, obviously we worked together on it, but, you know, the idea was generated from you in the, initially. And, you know, yeah. what, what kind of what kind of made you found your policy so to kind of keep it brief at the core is this lack of, of proper representation of narratives within the city uh of just being at the mercy of whatever as i said the media feels like today if they want to if they want to portray you as you know um as a terrorist they will and if they want to portray you as some kind of freedom fighter they will as well um to me it's like Tripoli is really a mosaic. It really does not have a paintbrush. There are really people from all all sorts of of you know the walks of life. You can find all of them, and and you know it's very easy for the media to pick someone and go talk to. Them. So I always notice, and we you know this is internally people in Tripoli always discuss it, is that whenever the media comes to do an interview in the city, and you, they usually go to what is probably you know the poorest neighborhood in the city and pick probably someone that that you know uh, maybe they assume lacks formal education. And to go ask them about, you know, a massively uh, important uh, problem around the city. Yeah, that complex, doesn't mean in any complex, complex issues. issues yeah. and, that, but, and that doesn't mean that they should not do that. that. However, what it means is that they should be asking, you know, people from different walks of life. And at the same time, I would say if, if uh, it is unfair, if you're only, you know, showing one particular aspect of the city, let's say you go to the richest neighborhood and you kind of portray like this is the city. No. Um, there as well are a lot of people that, you know, uh, come from different economic backgrounds that come from different places, even they even they speak differently, uh, even their culture, if you want to go on a microculture kind of way has has a lot of differences that occur within them. So the, the point is, is why do we always try to, to create like a frame and put the whole city within it? Well, you know, it is very diverse. I mean, I don't know if people know this, but um, there is actually the only place in Lebanon that has, you know, Lebanese people are from African descent is in Tripoli, uh, and they, they exist, you know, in the in the, in the MENA region over there, and they are they, they are as much the Tripolitan as you, me, and, and anyone else. Uh, well, people didn't even know about. The, well, why don't we, you know, maybe ask them about their own experience or their own opinions or, in a way? I'm pretty sure people don't don't like know this because, you know, it's very selective in what you're presenting. So to us, uh, at least, you know, the idea was that let's create kind of a, a local grassroots way of representing the city uh, by creating true policy and focusing really on, on the field of public policy and representation for the city. This became a website. Uh, and what we've been doing uh, effectively with definitely your help, Rafet, and, and all the others working with us is that we're trying to create the, we got, we're trying to meet up with the people of the city and ask them about their problems, their issues, and a lot of talk about it. This isn't in any way, um, well, you know, like a page that's trying to like, you know, just basically, um, you know, increase tourism by just showing the nice, the nice areas. No, yeah. the, the idea was that, you know, let's talk about the problems. Let's talk about the good, let's talk about the bad and try, but, but just let's talk about it in a way uh, where we know there isn't an agenda behind it. Where yes. the only agenda effectively is that we want what's best for the city, not because, you know, uh, today um, someone received uh, is on payroll of a particular regime or government or, you know, a party. And it's in their interest to actually say, say something versus something else. Yes, yes. No, 100 percent. And, uh, you know, just for for the audience here, um, you know, I, I highly recommend if you're interested in Tripoli and uh, and the you know internal dynamics of the city and the rising stars in the city. I highly recommend you all to check out tripolicy.org and you can find a bunch of interviews that have been conducted from the Tripolicy team and you can kind of get a, you know, get a sneak peek into what many people in Tripoli are kind of facing, the challenges and how they've overcome it or uh, just kind of ways that, uh, or ideas, basically fresh ideas to uh, enhance the image of Tripoli and its economic um, profile. Uh, with that being said, I think this is a great, uh, great way to end this uh, podcast episode. Yes, and I want to thank you so much. You know, you've you've really delved into uh, very minute, uh, detailed uh, topics that relate to Tripoli. So I want to thank you for that succinct and uh, you know very organized um, uh, response for all the questions that I asked. And uh, really, it's been an honor to have you on.
Thank you so much, Trav. I've It's an honor to be part of the Tripolitan, which truly is, a, you know, a pioneering concept in Tripoli, and I'm sure it's going to, you know, uh, grow and become a beacon of another part of the representation effort that we're saying. Uh, it's, it's people from the city talking about the city and telling the world about it. That is that is the goal, man. That is yep, the goal, yep, and we yep. hope we can achieve it together. Uh, I want to thank the audience for listening in today. Uh, please uh, follow us on Spotify and Google Podcasts, and you can find us also on Twitter and YouTube and Facebook. Thank you all, and have a good day.